Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm here to talk with you about the science of the airflow, which was, in fact, the first modern car, and the first car totally based on science. Because before then, cars were mostly done as an art and as a set of independent systems or pieces, to the point that the front and rear suspensions were designed and tuned separately. This car would almost certainly never have happened if not for Fred Zader, Owen Skelton, and Carl Breer. They had met in engineering school and bonded over a belief that using science and engineering principles is the best way to solve problems. Now, many companies at that point lacked serious research labs or testing facilities. Now, Zader, Skelton, and Breer did use science to create the Chrysler six-cylinder, focusing on the engine itself and they built a 68-horsepower straight-six at a time when that was seriously hot stuff, especially in a mid-priced car, which is what the 1924 Chrysler was. To get there, they did things like uh, testing out single-cylinder engines with different types of heads and then changing the heads slightly and retesting them to generate the most power with the most durability and the least fuel use. But they really didn't apply those principles to the rest of the car. They didn't really look at the car as a system. They looked at each individual part and each subsystem separately. And the car body itself remained, as it had been, derived from horse-drawn coaches. Now, once Maxwell Motors, which was making the Chrysler, became profitable, Zader, Skelton, and Breer said, we really have to start making a car scientifically from the ground up thinking about every single part of the car. It was a truly ambitious effort, and it was hampered by the sheer ambition, coupled with not really thinking about how they would build it, and that's what really killed the airflow in the end. Now, of course, we all know about the aerodynamics part of the airflow. It's the most obvious part of the car, partly because it's the visible part, that you can look at it and immediately say, now, that's something that was designed to slip through the air Although it was not as aerodynamically good as it could have been, the science was really at a dawn at that point, and they did pretty well considering. And they started out with model cars and a wind tunnel. And at one point, this might be an apocryphal story, but at one point one of them put in a car facing the other way, and it was actually more aerodynamic facing backwards. And they did a lot of work to try to make the cars more, more aerodynamic including the tapered tail, the rounded fronts, and the sealed beam headlights were part of that. They were the first company to use sealed beam headlights. In fact, they are the reason why sealed beam headlights were created, because they wanted to have them mounted in the fenders themselves so that they could minimize wind drag. I'm not entirely sure that that strategy worked, but it gave us sealed beam headlights, which were the standard of the auto industry for about half a century. Now, maybe more significant than the aerodynamic work was work on vibration frequencies, center of gravity, and cornering. The team measured the vibration frequencies of numerous cars, including their own. And they found that European cars of the day had a very, very high vibration rate, and American cars had a higher vibration rate than was comfortable for most people. Their cars, they could get down to 90 to 200 cycles per minute and that they considered to be very close to a human walk, which they, which they registered as 90 to 100 cycles per minute. Now, how did they do that? Partly, they tuned the front and the rear suspensions together as a unit. They adjusted the springs properly, and they moved the wheels around and the axles, and mainly, they moved the seats. So they moved the engine forward by 20 inches so that it would ride over the front axle, and they moved the people forward so that they would ride between the axles instead of having the back seat passengers all the way at the back of the car over or behind the rear axle. If you've ever been on a bus, then you know that you don't want to be over or behind the rear axle. And that was one of two things that caused them to say that they had the first ride inside motor car and the first really spacious car. The second part was that they essentially drew a semicircle from the front to the rear, and then they widened the car where the passengers went in the middle. And that made the interior much wider and larger. Incidentally, they had a marketing term for the whole thing where they tried to make the spring movement slower, and that was called floating ride. And it really did work. The interior of the car was much more comfortable, and people found who people who were not able to read a book in the car before now found that they could read in the car while somebody else drove. Hopefully while somebody else drove. They theorized 
and they proved that having a stiffer body helped both cornering and rides, so they made the airflow body part of its structure. So instead of the ladder frame that was common in that day, they had a sort of cross between an airframe and a regular frame, uh, which was a type of unit body design. So the frame ran up the fender line, crossing the cowl, and went all around the door openings and along the roof. It was much stiffer than the regular body-on-frame cars of the day, especially since most of them were still using metal over wood, where wood was the main structural unit. Making the entire body out of steel, of course, was something that they got from Dodge Brothers and Briggs Bodies work, because they were the first to make an entire car out of steel. But they had bought Dodge Brothers, and then they took the steel design to a new level and made it more practical. And they had already done that by this time. Now, as Chrysler itself noted internally, some of the disadvantages of the airflow were the expensive body and mostly the long body. It was a very long body compared to a regular car that they, that they themselves made, and part of that was the long tapered tail, which incidentally was the first to have an integrated trunk, and the 1934s at least didn't have an outside opening to that trunk. You had to get there from inside the car. It was behind the back seat. They did figure it out pretty quickly, but the reason that you call the rear compartment in a car the trunk is because it used to be an actual trunk mounted to the back of the car, and Chrysler made it an integrated part pretty much through the present day. It had an automatic overdrive system, which was quite nice, although rather expensive to make, so that at around 45 miles an hour, it could shift into overdrive on its own, allowing the engine to drop in revs, which made the interior quieter and increased fuel economy and might have increased the top speed. And that's one reason why current airflow owners say that they're very confident at modern highway speeds. The rigid body, the well-tuned suspension, the hydraulic brakes on all four wheels, but also the fact that the engine isn't as stressed as it could be otherwise because of that overdrive. And as somebody who has a three-speed torque flight, where the top gear ratio is one to one, I can tell you I would love to have an overdrive. Now they also had a Philco radio which could be installed in the dashboard as a $55 option. That was also innovative with a super heterodyne circuit designed specifically for car use. It had full size speakers, a four point equalizer and automatic volume control, believe it or not. A Chrysler had to work with Pittsburgh plate glass or PPG, create the first curved safety windshield. The cost of this was such that it was only installed on the top-of-the-line luxury model, the Chrysler CW, which was a nine-passenger sedan, which also had the first power partition window ever in a car. And Motels has a story on one of the CWs that was lent to the most popular radio personality of the day, a guy named Major Bose, who basically started the whole on-air talent show thing on the radio with viewers, uh, sorry, listeners, calling in to vote. So now you know who's to blame for that. The Chrysler and DeSoto Airflow were both revealed at the 1934 New York Auto Show, 10 years after the original Chrysler B70 was shown there. Customers were quite enthusiastic and they got over 20,000 orders, but mo around half of those would be withdrawn before the car was actually made. What was the problem? Well, really it was that Zader, Skelton, Breer, and Chrysler had been so excited that they had not really thought about how to make the car. And the main problem there was its length. It couldn't negotiate the turns in the assembly plants that they had then. They were relatively small plants. The cars would make a lot of turns going back, going around, and they had a lot of roof supports in those plants. And it also required new techniques for construction in general because it was the company's first unibody. So it required a lot more factory preparation, but they did not plan ahead for that. And they introduced the car far too far in advance, and GM and Ford were able to spread dirty, malicious rumors about it because they had nothing that could come close to it. And they really had to uh, badmouth the car or else they'd lose a lot of money to it. Another problem with the airflow, which is not often mentioned by auto historians, is that it was very expensive to make. Part of that was the size, part of that was the unit body, it was just a pricey car, and it was still during the Depression. It was 1934 when it was introduced, and it was always Chrysler's most expensive car while they made it. It was just much more costly than the body-on-frame cars. So what happened in 1934 was that both Ford and Chrysler did a crash program to adapt the airflow's unique attributes, like moving the seats, moving the engine, 
getting the suspension tuned properly. They took all of these things, which Chrysler advertised, basically telling Ford how to do it. And they both came out with 1935 body-on-frame cars that were normally priced, normally sized, conventionally styled, sold like hotcakes, uh, and had most of the advantage of the, of the airflow without having all the advantages. A lot of critics said that the main problem with the airflow was the funny looks. It was designed, styled by engineers and not by a stylist. So they tried making it look more normal in future years, and that didn't really help all that much. It was really, I think, personally, the premium price. Packard probably could have sold the cars. Chrysler couldn't, even though they were really quite nice looking inside. So long term, the company had lost market share, but it's the main problem with the airflow for Chrysler was that it became overcautious. The company lost its confidence in its own engineering, and they realized that styling was more important than they had thought. Another problem is that really the unit body design is very expensive if you've got a wide range of body styles that people expect, such as at the time, business coupes, coupes, sedans of different sizes, wagons, and so on. Now, Chrysler stopped showing interest in aerodynamics until they started racing in NASCAR. Well, actually, until quite a few years after they started racing in NASCAR. And then they did the 69 Dodge Charger 500 and then the Charger Daytona and Superbird. But on production cars, they didn't really do a whole lot of aerodynamic work until after the fuel crisis. So the airflow was the uh, unibody car and then the airstream was the body on frame. What's interesting is that the airflow really was the car that all cars of the future, which is to say today, would be based on. For the first time, passengers were riding between the axles instead of on them, so the ride was sensational at the time. The unit body came back. I mean, Chrysler went almost completely unit body in 1960, and today pretty much all regular cars are unit body designs other than pickup trucks and such. Likewise, overdrive became very common, not to mention car radios. It's a shame, really, because if they had paid more attention to how the, the cars would be built up front, they really could have probably made them into a success. If they had been a little bit less ambitious about it, started out with the Airstream and then went to the Airflow, that would have also been a really big success. But they, they really started too big. They tried to change too much at once without thinking about manufacturing, how they were actually going to build it, and they were hit pretty hard. Still, for a number of years before World War II, Chrysler was the number two automaker, and part of the reason why was because of all the lessons they learned by looking at the entire car scientifically with the Chrysler Airflow, one of the most influential cars ever made in the history of the car. Well, I've got a page on Motels.com, which has more pictures, so drop by Motels. Uh, I'm also going to mention Motels Now, which is our new relevant news site, or as I would call it, history as it's being made. And uh, you might want to look up my book, Century of Chrysler, on Amazon. Century of Chrysler covers the full 101 years from 1924 Chrysler to 2025, and it also looks at how Chrysler came to be starting before 1904 with Maxwell. In the meantime, I'll see you soon.